Hey everybody, your old pal Michael Reno here with my good friend Red Hickey from WDVX Radio in Knoxville, Tennessee and all over the internet. Uh, we're at Red's wonderful home here. <laughs> Whose boots different. are these? They're not all mine. Some of them belong to my husband. My feet aren't quite that big, but, <laughs> but most most of them are mine, and they can't even see them all, so that's a good thing. Oh, we're going to show them the rest of the stuff in this house. She's got the most amazing home. We're here in South Knoxville, Tennessee, across the river. Uh, we've had a wonderful time so far this afternoon, just okay. visiting. It's been and catching fun up. having you. We've, we've, how long have we known each other? I've been at that radio station for 23 years now. Well, then we've known each other a about long that time. long. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Back when it was still in the camper. The camper. At Fox yeah. Hills Campground. Yeah. Red uh, is quite a personality, and as you can tell from all the, all the stuff that she's got in her house, quite a collector. It's a nice way to put it. It is a nice way to put it, but you're a nice person. Uh, what's your first memory of music? My first memory of music, other than, you know, watching, you know, Lawrence Welk or Hee Haw or something like that, live music, uh, was sort of what we, we were talking about earlier. I, I was really, in, um, my family would take me to Buddy's Barbecue to see um, bluegrass music when I was little. Buddy's Barbecue happened and it really, I, re I learned about live music there because my family wasn't real musical. Was there music in your home? Um, they made us take music lessons. <laughs> they played the radio, but there wasn't... Uh, my father was a sports person. My mother was tone deaf. When you got control over your own music, in other words, you started buying your own records, listening to your own radio, what were you listening to? Uh... So um, I used to take organ lessons, and if I got a gold star, my mom would let me uh, buy a 45, and I remember having the DeFranco family. What kind of music was the DeFranco? The Partridge family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was pop kid pop, music. Yeah. Um, I remember buying a Linda Ronstadt album, I mean, record. It was just the single. Um, but, yeah, it was it was mostly... In that day, radio played everything across the board. It was all right. mixed together. Yep. And so it, it was whatever the pop tune was that I knew from the school bus. Yeah, yeah. That's the one I was going to buy, you know. So your first live music memory would have been Buddy's Barbecue? Yeah, that would probably be my first. Did your family go there to eat? They were the going house? there to eat, and they knew there was a show. Uh, we might have company and it was a good place to take people, mm -hmm. you know, to the show and stuff. And, uh, I mean, my my dad loved music. Um, I mentioned he was in sports. He was a, a golf pro. And one of the country clubs where um, he used to be a golf pro, they would bring in, like, mega big-time uh, big bands. Mm -hmm. And he was For like, dances. yeah, he was into the big bands or... It could be somebody like Charlie Rich they'd bring in mm -hmm. to play or something. But um, my dad loved music, and he had uh, lots of eight tracks. Um, but uh, more of a listening thing than enjoying live music. You know, any live music I got was probably church. Right. Now, the bands at Buddy's Barbecue, Knoxville Grass? Mm-hmm. Pinnacle Boys, Pinnacle New Boys. Dawn. Mm -hmm. um, I did see Ricky Skaggs there. Um, I would love to say I was one of the ones that got to see Keith Whitley one of the times he came through, but I don't really think I did, and I was too small. But it's a great idea. And I didn't know who half the bands were I was seeing at the time that I was seeing them. Did you ever consider performing? I have, um, actually. So when I lived in Atlanta, uh, I went to college in Atlanta. I stayed there for a little while to work, and I became obsessed with um, bluegrass music uh, as an, more of an adult, and I found I was wasting too much time watching 
Oprah or whatever every afternoon when I came home from work and I decided I wanted to use my time better. So I started playing mandolin because I was obsessed with Bill Monroe and I became um, the vice president of the Bill Monroe Fan Club. Knoxville had a Bill Monroe Fan Club. It was the the American Bill Monroe. You were the vice president of the national. Fan well, Club. I was more of the Georgia chapter. I was uh, in the Georgia you're chapter. In I was living in Atlanta at that time, but I got to meet Bill many, many, many times. And did you dance that, with him? I didn't ever dance with him. I got a bunch of pictures made with him, and he, he let me kiss him on the cheek a couple of times. But um, <laughs> I shook his hand once, and was, it, I, it took me a month to be able to play the guitar again. He was a funny man, you know. He was very um, uh, slightly vain, you know. He like he had to take his glasses off. He would not. He didn't right. like to have his glasses on when he was being photographed, and he wanted to make sure he was all together and everything. But uh, anyway. This led me on to play mandolin for a while. Um, I was actually, um, Jim Tolls, my mandolin teacher, played in the band uh, Goose, Goose Creek Symphony. Mm -hmm. And um, so he um, taught me, and he taught me about jams and introduced me to some dear friends that are, I'm still friends with to this very day. But when I moved back to Knoxville, I found one of those little jams. Um, this one was in a little uh, school building up in Townsend. It's called Rocky Branch. It's yeah. very famous. So lots of, again, it's a little cliquish, and you have to kind of know the etiquette. You don't just bust in on somebody's jam. You're invited in or whatever. But um, I was well accepted up there, and I found a group of girls, and we started picking together, and... Uh, we had a band name. Nobody ever used it. We were called That Girl Band wherever we went. I like so that. we <laughs> embraced the name That Girl Band. It was the Oconee Bells was our original name, oh, which like is that. a flower. But nobody liked the girly flower name. They called us That Girl Band. So I played with them for about oh, a good 10 years, I guess. And uh, we've we've all moved you know, in different <laughs> places, and uh, they're they were a little older, and um, don't well. I should take that back because one of them's playing music more than me, and I don't play music at all now. But she plays weekly still, so they're they're all still making music. But yes, long story short, I you're, have played but, music. In but my you're life dead now. in the middle of music all the time, aren't you? Yeah, it, that's sort of what happened was when you work five days a week in music and then your whole weekend is spent at a festival playing somewhere and then you got to get up and be back at work on Monday again. It got more like work than fun. Yeah. So, but you know, music should be fun. So absolutely. Absolutely. You're known for two things to the general public, uh, your personality, your on air personality, but you're known for your fashion. Uh, yeah. Now that's a matter of opinion when it comes to fashion. <laughs> <laughs> you, but you studied fashion in Atlanta. I right? did do that. Tell us about that. Well, um, I. What prompted that? I begin my college life in engineering. Uh, I did drafting in high school, and I adored it. And I loved detail work and drawing and. I went to um, a technical college to, you know, I thought engineering might be a direction for me. And um, I was really more interested in thrift store shopping <laughs> and embroidery and doing little beadwork and stuff. And I had a, a college counselor that said, um, you know, you and I should talk about some things. And she handed me a pamphlet for fashion college and she just said something like you know I think maybe you should consider a maybe a career change and um, it was for a college in Atlanta and I talked to my dad about it and he was like well let's go down and look at it and I landed in fashion college and I did it for a while in Atlanta uh, a pretty long while the company I worked for moved to New York City and I didn't want to move to New York City so um, 
I was actually um, doing some working in art and uh, I worked for a sign company uh, temporarily where I became an expert in Braille. I ended up staying in Atlanta for uh, you know, a total of 15 years. It took a while, um, but... Well, you're a Knoxville girl. Yeah, I was born and raised here. My family was here. My husband's from here and his family's from here. So it, it was the right decision to come back. When we came back, it was... How long have you been back in Knoxville now? About 23 uh, years. Yeah, 23, 24. You're such a part of the WDVX family. Let's get back to WDVX, my favorite radio station. Uh, how did that come about? How did you get hooked up with that? Wild bunch. Um, the very first day. Now, see, we were already big fans of WDVX while we were living in Atlanta. But the very first day that we moved back, we should have been unpacking boxes and moving into our house. But um, there was camper fest going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the campground, at the original camper. And we heard it on the radio and we are like, we can unpack boxes later. Let's go to Camper Fest. So give give the audience, just in case they don't know, give them the skinny on WDBX. How did it start? Tell us about this camper. What's the deal? So Tony Lawson and a man named Don Burgraff had decided to start this radio station. They had ideas. They knew they wanted it to be Americana, um, which... When well, twin, that would have been twenty six years ago. Wasn't really a thing, you know. We were at the you first Americana music convention, which was, I don't know. Tw I had. I'm trying to think what record I had out then, but it, it was late nineties, I think. And you have to explain to everybody what Americana. Americana. Is, we okay? always used to say Americana is that music that you don't know what to call it. Or, um, I always called it the redheaded stepchild. The, the one, right. the music that doesn't fit on any of the radio stations that right. are already out there, that's the music that we play. Americana and <laughs> folk, uh, the worlds that I've worked in most of my career, all the radio, like they used to send us on radio tours, a record label would. So you'd go to all these radio stations to do a, an interview with folks like you. But they were all community radio, public radio, or college radio. Mm -hmm. Because if you had to sell cars, bluegrass music wasn't going to do it in uh, Nebraska. Right, sure. So, Well, Don and Tony had this idea that we're going to put bluegrass, and we're going to put classic country, and we're going to put blues, and we're going to put singer-songwriter, and we're going to put Celtic, and we're going to put roots, all this, everything all together. And... They didn't have a place. Uh, Fox Inn Campground had... Which is was, in North, right? Well, in the Clinton North area, yeah. Right. And it... They had a camper available. Um, Dawn literally, I don't know, used some sort of a car radio to make it all work. I don't really know how it all worked, but they made this radio station inside a camper, which... It lasted about five years. The camper was old, and um, and it was a tiny camper, it, folks. It was fourteen like, feet yeah. on the inside from feet. end to end. The first time that I was exposed to this radio station, Greg Hills, who was the original uh, programmer for WNCW Radio uh -huh. in North Carolina, was my manager. He'd he'd stop stopped doing that and was my manager and we were on tour and we'd done I think the down home in Johnson City and then we're on the way to Nashville and so he said I've got this this uh, there's a new radio station Americana radio station and I've got it set up to do a an on-air there so he gave the directions as I was driving the bus and he said turn here and we got off and we went up he said now turn in here and I said well this can't be it it's a campground no, so many people did and that. And I know it, we've, everybody's got the same story, I know. But So we just drove past that little camper and right down to the office of the campground and walked in and I said, uh, we're here to do a radio interview. Where do, we, where do we go? And she said, well, it's not here. And I said, well, where is it? And she said, well, you passed it coming in. I said, we didn't pass anything but a tiny camping trailer. She said, that's it. 
So we pulled the bus up there, and it was three times longer than the camper. And Grace was out in the yard going, it's here. You're going to be in Studio C, which meant Way couch. down the hall. Yeah, it's like from here to there. It's just, um, and the, the table in between was Studio B, right. you know. The DJ stood in A, and there was the couch down there that was C. And right in the middle, there was something about like this little microphone that dropped down from the ceiling and yep, yep. you sat at a table and talked into this little thing That's and it. we i can remember um the hackensaw boys coming in there and there being about nine of them yeah and they were everywhere they were in the sink on the table on the back of the chairs it was so tiny in there but we squeezed so many people and so many, uh, uh, I've met so many guys on the road that go, did you ever play the camper? It's or did crazy. you have to, if you're the bass player, you always either had to stand outside the door on the first step because the bass wouldn't fit. Or there was one hole where there, yeah, there was, was a, a skylight. Right. And if you didn't have a fiddle player that needed that space, then the bass player could have it. But now those days are gone, and now you're on Gay Street, the main drag right downtown. Just like the old at the days. Visitors, the Knoxville Visitor Center. Mm -hmm. Inside Visit Knoxville, and it's just about a half a block from where the midday marigold ground used to be. For those of you who don't know, uh, they brought back music to the main street, Gay Street, in Knoxville, Tennessee, for years. There were programs like uh, uh, the... The, the Wheeling uh, Jamboree uh, in uh, the Chicago Barn Dance, of course the Grand Ole Opry, uh, the Louisiana Hayride, and the Midday Merry-Go-Round was part of that. And they were unofficial farm teams for the Grand Ole Opry. If you could make it there, you might get a shot at the Opry. And of course that was the top of the heap. So there's, there's this history in, in Knoxville, Tennessee of music on Gay Street. And WDDX has brought that back. They have. And the interesting thing is that I, I told you my mom wasn't real um, musical earlier, but I had an aunt who loved to go down there, my mom's sister. It was every every day, Monday through Friday, from noon till one or two. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was a couple hours. But it was a, it was a big show. It was They had big names. lots of big yeah. names. And it was almost like an Opry cast. They had comedians. They had bands. They had solos. They had fiddle fiddle players. It, just everything. So my, my, my aunt uh, always wanted to go down, and my mom didn't care much, but whatever my, her older sister would jerk her up and they'd get on the bus and tell my tell their mother my grandmother that they were going to a movie downtown but really they would go to the midday merry-go-round and my grandmother thought that was hillbilly music mm. and it was beneath us you know not for my girls they you say know. ain't and stuff down there yeah <clears throat> yeah, those farmers go down there and watch music, you know, <laughs> and uh, my my grandmother didn't think it was a appropriate place for young girls to be, but, yeah. When we say that they brought back music to Gay Street, not only is the radio station there, and it's in the visitor center, you can stop by anytime and say hello, but the thing is they brought live music back to Gay Street, so every Monday through Friday, or every Monday through Thursday now, you are busy. It's Monday through, well, we At do the, the show Monday through Saturday. It's six days a week, but I'm only there Monday through Friday. Right. I it's gotta, on Saturday now. Yeah. But Monday through Thursday, it's at the station, and mm -hmm. on Friday... It's the Big Plate Live from Barley's. Right. Um, we have teamed up. Barley's has been a great um, supporter of WDVX for many years, actually. Um I don't know how long we've been doing the big plate. Took me a minute to get used to doing it in somebody I else's think I, house. I've been doing it every year, and I think this may be my fifth. Five, yeah. I think it's we've been five, and probably with the pandemic, it might have been six years since we moved over there. But, um, yeah, it works. Um, you and know, it's... people like to come out, and sometimes in the beginning, we used to have lunch in right. the visitor center daily. 
now it's just Fridays at Barley's, but people like to have a little lunch with their music as well, sure. so it, it works well. And you book all that. I do. Now she's talking about Monday through Thursday, it's two acts for the hour. Mm -hmm. So that's two, four, six, and then one on Friday typically. So that's seven. Then you do how many on two Saturday? Two more on Saturday. Good Lord. That's a lot of booking. People have no idea what you go through to make a schedule work because we're all out here on the road traveling and we're only going to be there a certain day. Well, we can't make that work. We've already got that day booked. It just goes on and on and on, doesn't it? It's a thing. I spent a lot of time up there at that desk and um, doing the booking thing. It's, it's a dance that I finally figured out how to do. Um, it's the cancellations I haven't quite learned how to handle just yet because you don't know when they're coming and they can happen in the middle of the night or um, well the car trouble yeah. van trouble exactly. bus trouble exactly i mean Working. all kinds of things i you know i've had death i've had i'm um, you know covid uh or oh my gosh we just wrecked the van you know or you know there's all kinds of crazy things um but that's show business that happened and um that's just the B side to that is living in a good music community where you can have um, a good, healthy um, collection of artists that you can call and say, uh, what are you doing tomorrow? <laughs> Any chance you're available tomorrow? Right, right. Um, and, you know, I think in the past two years we've had one day that somebody didn't show up and they didn't let us know that it was happening you know until it was like maybe 10 minutes before showtime and then we just had to like tell the audience sorry right. yeah. but for the for the most part we um we just jerk somebody in there and the show goes on regardless describe the typical wdvx listener what do you what do you think I don't know that there is a typical one because um, everybody likes something different. And when you're mixing music together like we do, yep. everybody's got an opinion. Okay. If you say, you what's don't. a typical country music fan, they like country music. Yeah. But when you're talking about Americana music, that's a pretty broad scale. Isn't yeah, it? you got people that'll go like, I don't like that. You all shouldn't play that, you know. But then there's other people that love that, you know. Yeah. So... We just used to always just say, if you don't like what's happening right now, just wait just a second. Something totally different is going to come on in just a minute. And That's right. And you'll be happy then. It's so just... tell us how people can listen to WDBA. Oh, my goodness. So um, we air on old-fashioned radio. You can, if you've got one of those kind of cars, which they're still supposed to, they're still putting the radios in there, so we'll still they're going to be there. As and where long is as it we on the dial? Be. Well, right now it's 89.9. Uh, that's if our you're main Nashville. signal. But we also have a 102.9 signal that helps downtown people with the uh, bigger buildings. And then we have a 103.9 that helps some outer lying areas. And the reason for this is because if you are a um, nonprofit community radio, you have a wattage restriction on your tower, which I think it's 300, 300 watts. Tiny. Which means floodlight level almost, you mm -hmm. know, wattage here. Um, so it's tiny. So the easier thing to do is to, to relay it to other right. um, transmitters so you can spread out. Well, we're talking to people all over the world here. People all over the world can hear you, too. They can. They can um, listen on the Internet at WDVX.com. And also, we Facebook Live and YouTube Live the um, Blue Plate specials Monday through Saturday. And um, we also have a YouTube channel where from mm -hmm. uh, um, each performance, a video is produced of the artist picking and we will um, produce a video and all of that is on our YouTube channels as well, which is 
totally different than listening to the radio. It's watching and listening videos, right. basically. We're working on a new uh, YouTube channel, which is going to be all classic archived, you know, 15, mm. 25 year old material that we have that I think people want to hear. There's I probably think... some old Michael Reno Harrell in there. <laughs> there probably is. I've been playing since it was at the campground, so thank you for that. Here's, here's one last question for you. If you had a time machine and you could go back anywhere, anytime, and see one concert, mm. where would you go? Does it have to be what I've already seen or something it I didn't be, get if, to see? If you had a time machine, you could go back and watch one concert. I don't care if you were there or not and you want to go back, what would it be? Hmm... I I think I would have really liked to have seen Hank Williams in my lifetime. I have seen so many people um, from a teen to my life now. I'm a concert goer. I go see music all the time. I love music. I love festivals. I didn't ever get to see Hank Williams, and I would have liked to have seen that. You know, He was gone before you got here. Yeah. And... Um, yeah, I would have liked that opportunity. I've seen the other Williams family, peoples, all the daughters and the sons, but um, I didn't ever I think get a lot to of people him. would would be sitting there with you if they could, too. Yeah, um, you know, I was fortunate. Like I said, I got to see Bill Monroe many times and Jimmy Martin and Ralph Stanley and all, you know, the Osborne brothers and... Got to see it all, but I, you know, even George Jones and um, um, Merle Haggard and, of course, Willie's still with us. I don't think I ever, I didn't ever see Waylon. Yes, I did. I did. I saw him at a Willie Nelson um, Farm Aid once. Mm. But, yeah, Hank is probably the one that got away from me, for sure. And maybe Keith Whitley in there, too, because I'm still not sure um. whether he was... He was something. <laughs> yeah, was I was. Right. I don't. I. I don't think. When he, he was, was with J.D. Crow, that was ah, some what a singing. Band. Wasn't that good? Yeah, man. When Jimmy Goodrow was playing mandolin, that was a band. Well, thank you all for watching, and thank, thank you to you Red for Hickey. To oh, W D V X <laughs> Radio. That's where it is, folks. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you sometime down the road. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.